Good morning, everybody, and by everybody, I think, I mean, good morning, Darren, because I think you're the only one here. How are you, Darren? Why don't you text me something here? Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Help Desk by everybody. Oh, there's two people now. That's great. <laughs> well, we'll just let people have a chance to to log on. Why don't you, if you're if you're watching right now, why don't you send a little a little live chat over here? Say hi. Say hey. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, welcome to Help Desk Live. This is my first fish tank. I'm Matthew. We do this every single Saturday morning, 9 a.m. till around 11 a.m. And it's a chance for you, a, a beginner, to come and ask your beginner question and get the answers. If I know the answer, I'll tell it to you. If I don't, we can go over here to our screen share and we can look it up. And not only that, but oftentimes we have some very, very experienced people who are also watching this and they will answer your questions right over here as well anyway that's about it uh if you can stay the whole time that's fantastic if you can't stay the whole time that's also okay because if you check back later today or tomorrow what i'll do is i will take all of the questions that i answered and i will put them with timestamps down in the description below so that all you have to do is just scroll down find your question click on the timestamp and voila there you'll you'll have your answer um if you guys are watching this if you guys could give this a thumbs up that would be absolutely fantastic but that's about it right now there's almost nobody here so we're just gonna hang out and chat uh, uh you're tired huh you've been working hard hey guys welcome back here welcome welcome we are live we are live we're just hanging out. Uh, by the way, um, if nobody shows up, that's totally fine. This is meant to be more of like like an open office hour. Uh, so people can drop in, stop by, not stop by. You kind of get it, so on and so forth. Oh, by the way, for anybody uh, watching, there's this huge giveaway going on that uh, I'm sponsoring. I've, I've never sponsored this sort of thing before, but let me find you guys the link. Uh, it's a Kate Aquarium giveaway with everything you need, and it is um, worth over fourteen thousand dollars. W E, yeah, I hear that. So it's an extremely, extremely um, awesome giveaway. So let me send you guys a link to that real, real quick in case you want to sign up. I get it if it's not your thing. Some people don't don't do that sort of thing, but uh, it's sponsored by. Uh, well, it's sponsored by me and by by many others as well. Um, but it's by a guy named a Reef Stash. So if you go here, let's see here. Uh, let me actually not share that with the world. Sorry about that, everybody. I will show you guys a link here in a second. And what is my password? Hi, everybody. Hi. We are just logging in to Instagram if I can here. What is my, oh, my first fish tank at gmail.com. I think I got it now. Here we go. Save info. Okay. So yeah, I'm just sharing with everybody here. Hi, everybody. Welcome, 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 welcome. Kate Aquariums are from Australia. Yeah, I think they are Australian, actually. Uh, but they're here in the U.S. as well. All right. No. All right. Here we go. So if you, if, 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 if anybody is interested in a 14 thousand dollar aquarium giveaway which i am one of the sponsors of obviously not the hit go and go here i will send you guys a link here um rob is running at reef stash and he's amazing at this it's sort of ridiculous how good he is at this stuff so here's the link basically how it works if you guys want to join up here i'll send the link right here um basically how it works is you click on the link and then you sign up with your name and email address and then you complete tasks. And I totally get it. This isn't for you. I get it. I get it. But you, you complete tasks and you get points and the more points you get, the more chances you have to win. Uh, it's really cool. I mean, so I sponsored it. I'm sponsoring t-shirts, stickers. I'm giving away an RODI unit and I'm giving away, um, I'll make a video for the winner about their tank so that they can kind of have that and they can use that video for kind of whatever they want. So that's kind of, that's kind of what I'm giving away here. Um, but yeah, if you guys want to check out that giveaway, it's running for the entire month of October until November 8th, I believe. And there's going to be all sorts of stuff and chances to enter. So check it out. I think it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, $14,000 
aquarium giveaway. According according to Rob, he says it's the it's the most valuable, biggest saltwater aquarium giveaway ever. And I didn't know this, but you guys remember last year when they had uh, when when Waterbox sponsored a ten thousand dollar giveaway, like a like a ten thousand dollar aquarium. Well, well, Rob won it. Uh, Reef Stash won it, and that's kind of what got him really excited and started down this route. All right, anyway, that was just a little heads up there. Welcome, everybody, who's who's joining us here. So far, it's, it's Darren and Louie Beats. Hey, Louie, how are you? Good to, good to see you. And Dwight, hey, Dwight, good to see you guys back. I'm so glad some of you guys keep on returning. That's so, so awesome of you. I hope everybody is doing well. Louie Be Beats, how you doing, huh? How's your day going so far? Dwight, how are you? Hope you're doing well as well. Uh, we're just hanging out right now. If you have a question or uh, something something you want to talk about, go ahead and put it in the chat over here, and I will go ahead and start answering those questions. But other than that, right now, we're just kind of... Oh, no. KW Man, my clownfish was dead already. Oh, tell me more, KW Man. What happened? Um, tell, me, tell me more about what happened to your clownfish. I'm, I'm curious. My clownfish died last week too, um, the one I was talking about, and it was awful. It was awful to watch uh, because he didn't die quickly. He died slowly. He had ick, and then he got a bacterial infection, and then he would just he would chase after the food and just chase after the food and chase after the food and try to eat it, but he just couldn't do it, maybe because his mouth hurt too, hurt too much. I was doing antibiotics, but he ended up not making it, so it was awful. So I am sorry to hear that, KW man. Do I, hey, William Peace Jr. Hi, Louis Beads getting off work. That's awesome. Dwight, Freaky Goblin. Hey, Freaky Goblin. Hope you're well too. Dwight, how was your week? It was a, it was an okay week. Um, ups and downs. You know, I got a, I got one of my videos done on time, which is great. It's not my favorite video. I don't know if you guys have seen it yet. Um, it is not my favorite video. Let's, let's actually take a peek here. It's about test kits, and I really planned this video out, and I just don't think it turned out well. Like sometimes I spend all this time planning stuff out, and ooh, planning stuff out here. Here, here is this one right here. Do, do, do. You guys are getting a little behind the scenes look at my stuff here. If we can get past the advertisement, sorry. When school isn't a place you have to be. Okay, that's loud. Why not go to school where? This is the one. I don't know if you guys have seen it yet. I, I just I just don't think it turned out very well. Um, and by the way, if you have watched the video, I screwed up the Seachem test kit. Somebody told me at Marine Depot, like, uh, Matthew, let me help you out here because you didn't do the Seachem test kit right. And they're right. I actually screwed it up. So the Seachem test kit actually does work. It was my user error. So I wish I could amend that. But good morning, everybody. Freaky Goblin. Would you recommend for someone who's setting up their first fish tank, start a mixery for start off with softies? The video went well, Matthew. Well, Darren, you're just kind to me. You're just you're just too nice to me. Um, yeah, it wasn't my favorite video, but I think it went okay. Um, I don't know. This next week, we're doing another video for... We're doing episode three of the Reef Octopus Aquaforest build, and we're going to set up all the equipment. So we're going to set up the sump and the pump and the lights. Not get it wet, but just set up all the equipment and kind of look at that. So that'll be our next video for Friday. Well, hey, everybody. Glad to see everybody here. We have a question, which is exciting. Uh, so I don't just kind of have to talk here. Uh, and KW Man, let me know what, what, what happened with your clownfish. Um, I'm definitely, definitely curious to hear about your clownfish. Alrighty, let's start with Rogue Aquariums. Would you recommend for someone who is setting up their first tank... Oh, good. Awesome. Oh, good. We're getting questions. Good. Okay. Um, would you recommend for someone who's setting up their first fish tank, start with a mixed reef or start off with softies? And I see Freaky Goblin already has an answer. And Freaky Goblin says, my opinion, Rogue, is aim for your end goal. No point getting all softies if you plan on later getting almost all LPS or SPS. Yeah. Uh, Freaky Goblin, I think has some really good advice. So, Darren, I'd be curious to know what your opinion is. I, I agree, agree with you, Goblin. I think you need to plan for your end goal, but one thing I would say is if your end goal is something incredibly difficult, like all SPS and non-photosynthetic corals, then I would say maybe take it one step at a time because 
if you're a total noob, a total beginner, and you're doing all SPS, and you're doing like non-photosynthetic corals, I think you might really struggle um, just because there are things that come up as we all know. You know, it's really hard to keep your parameters just perfect and to diagnose problems and to fix them quickly. So if your goal is something that is expert only, then I would say step up to it. You know, I don't think you have to start with a softy tank, but I think you could start with a softy slash large polyp stony tank and then work your way up to something more difficult. But I think Freaky Goblin's absolutely right um, by saying what's your end goal and really go for it and take some steps that you need kind of along the way. Alrighty, Louis B wrote, Louis Beats, what are your thoughts on the ice cap R-O-D-I unit? Let's look at it. Uh, that's true. However, a lot of people who start the first tank don't have the end goal in mind. They're inundated with a lot of information starting off. Yeah, Rogue Aquarians is right. A lot of people just see an aquarium or they're scuba diving or they're snorkeling and they're like, that is beautiful and I want that. And that's why in my videos, um, in my saltwater aquarium demystified videos, my 10 part series I did with Marine Depot, my first video says, know your goal. That's the number one thing I tell people is figure out what your goal is. And if you don't know what your, what your goal is, then you might not be ready just yet to start your saltwater tank, you might need to do a little bit more research first because the equipment you buy, the, the size tank you get, the kind of filtration you have really needs to be built around what your end livestock goal is. Anyway, that's that's obviously my opinion there. I agree, but a lot of folks don't have the end goal. Yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, ice cap, sorry, sorry, Louis Beats. What are your thoughts on the ice cap RODI unit? Do a little screen share. Oh, hey, that's me. Ice cap. Alrighty, ice cap, ice cap. Where is the ice cap RODI unit? Ice cap, ice cap. Ice cap's definitely more of a of a of, of a budget friendly. Wait, do they not? Do they not sell it at Marine Depot? Wait, let's check. Uh, let's check Amazon. Huh? Ice cap RODI. For anybody wondering, we are looking up the ice cap RODI. Ice cap RODI. Aquatic life. Am I missing it here, Louis? Am I missing it here? Because I'm not finding the ice cap RODI unit. I must be doing something wrong here. Ice cap aquatic life RODI. Ice cap RODI. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not finding it here. Ice cap. I must be missing something. Ice cap RODI filter. Hey everybody, welcome, welcome. Ice cap, here we go. Here we go, wait, here it is. Oh, Coral View, oh, maybe they don't sell it yet. Uh, let's take a peek at it. I've owned several RODI units, by the way. Here we go. I have never seen that, Louis. Um, I have never ever seen that, but this looks really cool. It's expensive, but check this out. Check this out, everybody. So, an RODI unit, I really don't, I mean, all RODI units are essentially the same. It's just the add-ons, okay? All RODI units, if you're buying an RODI unit for the saltwater aquarium hobby, is gonna have a sediment filter, a carbon block, a, co a carbon filter, then it's gonna go through an RO membrane, and then DI resin. and the areas you can change that, you could change the the density of your sediment filter, right? You could put in there different kinds of carbon. Some carbon will remove chloramines better. So depending on, on what kind of carbon you get, you could get like a chlorine or chloramine busting type of carbon. As far as I know, your RO membranes are pretty much all the same. There might be a slight slight difference in how much, how much water they let through. And then your DI resins, there's color changing, non-color changing. But other than that, what makes ones more expensive and what makes other RODI units less expensive uh, has to do with things like um, inline TDS meters. Does it come with TDS meters? Does it come with one TDS meter or two TDS meters, you know? And so that's one. Does it come with a booster pump? Is the booster pump uh, glycerin filled, you know? So is it gonna be a more, oh, sorry. Does it come with a booster pump? 
you know, uh, booster pumps are somewhat expensive, you know, because if you have low pressure, your RO membrane is just not going to function at all. So does it have a booster pump? Does it come with a pressure gauge? Is it an air filled or is it a liquid filled pressure gauge? Does it come with any sort of onboard computer that can automate things? Because there are DI units out there that are pretty much automated where every two hours it is going to automatically flush out your RO membrane, right? Um, does it come with, with um, uh, any sort of like auto stopping? So does it come with a solenoid valve? Uh, so anyway, those are all things that, that, that make them different. This one from IceCap, which I've never seen before, is really interesting. So it's expensive. $400 is, is pretty expensive here. But look at this one. Okay, so the first picture here it has a liquid filled pressure gauge. So that's high end. What do we got over here? Oh, it looks like it's computer controlled. So we have a solenoid valve over here. It looks like it, it has a booster pump down here. So that's fantastic. This this yellow stand is actually really cool. I've never seen anything like it before. Like it just means I, I, for anybody who's owned an RO, RO unit before, you know that they're very top heavy and tippy. So having a stand like this is just gorgeous. Like I, how have I never seen this before? I, I, I don't think I've seen it because I don't think Marine Depot sells it. Um, and that's where I do most of my shopping, but look at this. Fantastic. So Louis beats, uh, I have a very high opinion of this. I've, I've never actually seen it in person, but this is fantastic. It, it's only a four stage. So if you live in an area like Southern California, where you have a lot of chlorines or chloramines or your water super hard, you might want to consider a, a five stage or a six stage, but you can always upgrade. You can always add an additional RO membrane, um, and you can add an extra DI or two extra DI resin containers. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my thinking on that. It's nice. That, that, that's an expensive price point. $400 is expensive. You can get much cheaper RODI units, uh, RODI filter, which aren't as fancy, but much, much cheaper. I think you can get one for a hundred and oh, let's just look here. $160 from Marine Depot. I, I personally always recommend getting a reverse osmosis deionization unit for beginners, even though it's a it's a larger upfront cost. So for example, let's look over here. So here's the Marine Depot stock brand, um, clean water, four stage, nothing fancy, no booster pump. So, but look at this. I mean, only cost what, $149. You can also get, they just started selling the, where is it? the i did a video on it not spectra pure pure tech here we go pure tech here it is the pure tech standard one 160 dollars but this one comes with a uh, pressure gauge does it come with an inline tds meter i don't know if it comes with a inline i don't think it does come with an inline tds meter but also really really affordable all right hi everybody welcome welcome good to see everybody here my name is matthew from my first fish tank in case you're just joining us and you have come to the help desk we're here every single saturday 9 a.m to 11 a.m to answer your questions typically beginner questions if i have the answer i'll let you know if i don't have the answer we have a lot of experts who join us every single week and they will answer your questions over here in the chat and we will also go to a screen share and we'll just just look up last week we had a question that i couldn't answer but luckily we had somebody who knew all about the relationship between calcium alkalinity and ph and this last week, I did my own research search, so now I can actually answer that question. But it's really good to see you guys here. If you just joined us, you can go ahead and give this video a like. That would be great. All right, let's say hi to some people here. Louis Beats, what are your thoughts on the RODI units? Uh, Freaky Goblin, my opinion, Rogue, is to aim for your end goal. end goal. Yes, absolutely. I think a lot of people that do go to their LFS should be informed and do their research before they step into this hobby. Yeah, of course. Uh, agreed, agreed. Because, I mean, could you imagine if somebody didn't know how to take care of like a, a cat and a dog and went out and bought five cats and dogs and then they just all wasted away and died in their home, that'd be awful, right? So if that's awful, we should probably consider the fact that that's also awful when that happens in this hobby. You know, obviously there's more mortality amongst fish and livestock. That's just a part of the part of the hobby and a part of the game. Um, so it's not, it's not necessarily like an exact comparison, but yeah, I totally agree. Coral bud, my concern, all right, freaky golf. My concern with goal is it's, too easy to end up filling your tank with corals you will tire of in several months. Yeah, yeah, 
I get that. SPS, you can look at something like, I don't know how to say these. I don't, I'm terrible when it comes to coral names. So I'm, I'm going to try it. Ready? Um, look at something like Possil, I can't even read it. Possil Pora as a starter. LPS like hammers, frog spawn, fairly easy. Agreed. Freaky Goblin says, worth holding out for a coral you really want rather than just grabbing one just because it's there. Yeah, I agree. Because you know what really drew me to this hobby? And I and there's all sorts of things. Um, but one of the things was I remember 20 years ago now being in a fish store, a saltwater aquarium store in Seattle. I was in the university district right up by the UW for those of you who, who know the area. And there was an aquarium store there. And I went in and they had this anemone tank, I think it was. And they had clownfish in their anemones. And I was asking all about it. And the guy said, yeah, these, these anemones have been in my possession for 25 years. 25 years. No joke. He had had successful anemones. This is year 2000, maybe, for 25 years. I was talking and come to find out that there is no determined age for corals or for anemones. So what that means is technically they could live forever, right? I mean, there is no function in corals and anemones like in human beings and every other animal out there where we have a determined life lifespan because our cells start to decay and die. That just doesn't happen in, in, in coral anemones. So you could build a tank and you could pass that tank down for generations. I that was super cool. All right, see, Freaky Goblin, uh, Queen City Reefs and more. Are there devices that can flush the membrane with, with having to buy this specific RODI unit? I don't know Queen City Reefs and more. I don't think there are. You know, so let's, let's look at this unit here. I'm going to remember to screen share today. Okay, so this one doesn't come with anything, but if you get the Puritech Deluxe right here, which by the way is a part of the giveaway that I mentioned earlier, that's what I'm giving away. I'm actually giving away part of this $14,000 giveaway I sponsored. We're giving away this Puritech Deluxe because I don't need three RODI systems. <laughs> so I just need one. So we're going to give, give this one away and let somebody else have it. Uh, so this system over here, Queen, Queen City Reefs, it's really cool, $300, just a four stage, 100 gallon per day, really standard. But the thing that makes it special is this. And this is like the computer. And um, if you look, there's so many wires. I wish I could show you. I don't think they even show all the wires. But there are tons and tons of wires back there. So it has, basically, the computer tells it when to flush the RO membrane. So maybe you could you could purchase like the computer by itself and then set it up yourself, but man, I wish I could show you, but there are so many wires that it is intimidating. So unless you're like an electrician, it might be a little confusing with how to do that. Um, honestly, it's probably overkill. You probably don't need to flush your RO membrane every single two hours. It's fantastic that it can do that. Do that. But, I mean, unless you're living in an area with just atrociously hard water, for one, and where you're making hundreds of gallons of water a week, it's probably going to be sufficient to just use the manual flush valve and flush it for a minute before and after. I, I, I think that would be fine. But, yeah, I don't know um, Queen City Reefs. I don't know if there is something like this that you can just buy and set up. I don't, I don't think there is. Rogue Aquariums, I use BRS. Freaky Goblins, think a lot of people assume RODI units are going to be wall-mounted. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, I think that's, I mean, they're obviously meant to be wall-mounted. Um, and mine is finally wall-mounted, but you know how many years it took me to actually wall-mount my RODI unit? It took me six years. Six years. And that was pretty much due to complete laziness. So yeah, you're right. Uh, wall mounting, I think, is what most people assume as well. Rogue Aquariums. Uh, that ice cap looks good. Yeah, that ice cap did look really good. I totally agree. I think I've never seen this before. Does anybody know where they where they sell this? I have no idea where they sell this RODI unit. Um, Coral View, by the way, in case 
people don't know, Coral View doesn't sell direct. They um, are a distributor. So you can't actually buy from Coral View. Uh, you have to buy from, from somebody else. Uh, what's the availability of replacement filters? Oh yeah, what's the availability of replacement filters, etc. is another consideration. Absolutely, absolutely it is. Uh, here we go. Let's see. Modematronics. How to keep a tank at 45 at summer. Are you talking about like 45 degrees Fahrenheit? Is that what you're saying? Um, 45 degrees Celsius or centigrade would be well over 100, so that can't be what you mean. But I'm assuming you mean... And, and why would you need to keep a tank at 45? I mean, if you had to keep a tank at 45 degrees, really... There's only, I mean, I don't even know if chillers can go that cold, number one. Maybe they can. I don't think they can. You would need the world's biggest chiller or multiple chillers, or you'd have to, like, put your tank in a refrigerator or something. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know how you would keep a tank at 45 degrees. There has to be a way. There has to be a way. But I don't know if there's a commercially viable way on the hobby end. You could definitely jerry-rig something yourself if you had a really good understanding of, 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 of how to use coolers and um, but yeah I don't I don't really know how you would do that Louis beats which heater or heaters do you recommend oh good you're in California hey SoCal awesome what heaters do you recommend for a water box 220.6 let's talk heaters Louis beats let me have a little coffee here okay I I, I have rec I have recommendation for you but let's talk overarching heaters. And I think I have a gear guide on heaters, actually. Let's see here. He heaters? Here's I do. So, first up, when we're... Oh, hi, Scott. Hi, Scott. I'm Scotland. Hi, good to see you. Um, Queen City Reefs, by the way. Oh, yeah, I'll get... Uh, Queen City Reefs, yeah. Y you wouldn't need it. 44 TDS? Don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it. All right. Heaters. Let's talk he heaters. First and foremost, the thing I always recommend to beginners is to buy a temperature controller. Do it. Not only will it give you peace of mind, but it will keep your tank very stable. Very, very, very stable. So there are two major ones out there that you can get on Amazon, and then there are fancier ones like the Apex you can get. Don't You don't, you don't need something like that. You just need something like this. So if you're looking over here, this one is the Bayite. This is this is the one I recommend the most. There's also a company called Inkbird, um, also makes good ones. This is the one I like better. I like how it mounts better. This one's never failed on, failed on me. Birds have failed on me in the past, but this one has never ever failed on me. And what I like about this one is it has a heating and a cooling side, which a lot of the Inkbird birds have as well. And so what I do is I have a heater plugged in to the heating and I have it turn on at 7.7. All right, and then I have it turn off at 78. And then I have a fan plugged into the cooling element, and I have that set to go off at 78.3 and turn off at 78.0. So my total temperature fluctuation in my tank is just plus or minus 0 0.6 degrees, which is incredibly stable. Because if you don't use a temperature controller and you just trust the internal thermometer on your heater, your variation is probably going to be plus or minus two or three degrees. Not a big deal, but any sort of change in your water temperature that's relatively quick can cause stress for your corals and your livestock. So do yourself a favor, spend, what is this? I think it's $35, I think. Oh, it's gone down, down, $29, $29. And what I like about this one as well is uh, this temperature probe is replaceable so uh you can it, it it's just like a 3.5 millimeter like headphone port and so you can buy replacements for this so uh you can buy waterproof replacements so if you want to go to check this out um who sells them ink bird probe replacement only one place sells them waterproof here it is saltwateraquarium.com so if you want a totally waterproof probe, just go here. These are Inkbird ones, but it's just a three and a half millimeter jack. So I'm pretty sure it'll just work for the, for um, the Bay Eye temperature controller, 875. I mean, that's all it costs. It's crazy how cheap it is. Okay, so we're talking heaters, everybody, in case you're just joining the conversation, what heaters do I recommend? First thing, buy a temperature controller. Next up, buy two heaters. 
don't just settle for one. Every tank should have two heaters, your primary and your backup. Your primary heater, you're gonna plug in to the temperature controller you see right here. Okay, you're gonna plug it into there. The second heater is going to be your backup heater. And you are going to set that heater to two degrees less than your tank. So if your tank is set at 78 degrees, you're gonna set your backup heater to turn on at 76 degrees. Now your backup heater is not gonna be plugged in to a temperature controller. You could, you could, you could have a separate temperature controller to do that, but you don't need to, All right? So if you set it for 76 degrees, what that means is one day, your heater, your primary heater craps out and it will crap out. Heaters will crap out, it might be two years, it might be 10 years, but it will crap out. What will happen is your, is your temperature slowly drop until it gets to 76 degrees, degree, and then your backup heater, heater will kick in. Well, first of all, if you have a temperature controller like this one from Bay Eyes, it won't get all the way down to 76 degrees because you will set an alarm and it will beep at you when it gets to what, 77 degrees. I mean, you choose the parameters, right? But if for some reason that doesn't happen, you're out of the house and it craps out on you, then it will drop to 76 degrees and your backup heater will kick in. And then you'll get home and you'll hear the alarm and you'll go and run over and you're like, oh my God, why is my tank at 76 degrees? You will, you will know because your primary heater no longer works and you just saved your entire tank by purchasing two heaters. Then what do you do? You take that secondary heater, you promote it, it's like promotion day, you promote it to primary heater, you plug in the new primary heater into the Bayite temperature controller and you, buy, and you buy other backup controller and the process starts all over again. It is the best spent money for peace of mind. Okay, off the high horse there. So what heaters do I recommend? Let's take a peek here. Redundancy, absolutely. Redundancy, redundancy, yeah, we're talking redundancy here, is cru crucial in this hobby. There are three types, there are four types of heaters. There's ceramic heaters, there's glass heaters, there's titanium heaters, and there's inline heaters, okay? Um, the, mo the most common heaters and the mo least expensive heaters you're going to find are glass heaters. All right, my personal go-to brand that I've used for years is Eheim Jaeger. You can see it's number one, it's still my number one choice. They are inexpensive and they last forever. For example, I've had one of these heaters running for five years and it's never crapped out on me once, which is fantastic. I have broken two of these Eheim Jaeger glass heaters and I'm sure anybody here who has a glass heater who's been in the hobby for very long has broken them because it's glass, I've dropped them. I've hit them on things and it breaks, right? So are they the most durable? No, they are not the most durable, but 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 they are affordable, which is which is awesome. Okay, so that's my number one choice would be Eheim Jaeger. But if, but if you want something cheaper, there are cheaper glass ones. So uh, via Aqua, I, I don't know if this is a Marine Depot or if this is a Amazon thing. Let's see, it's opening. This is a Marine Depot one, cheaper, less expensive. Um, I own this one. It it works just as well as the Eheim Jaeger, non-name brand. Or you could go with another glass one, which is the Orlushi. This is an Amazon one. And uh, I've owned this one as well. Also very, very cheap. It's also never crapped out on me. So any of these are going to work. The thing about glass heaters, right? Glass heaters are, are quite long. So if... Um, Let's see here, who's asking this? Louis Beats, your 220 gallon, right? If we're looking here, let's see here. Which one would you need? If you went with the Eheim Jaeger True Temp, it looks like you would need the 300 watt. That's gonna be, that's gonna be a long heater, just FYI, okay? So you need to make sure you have enough space for how long that heater is gonna be. Um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of one of the only, the only, uh, thing about it. Um, so yeah, I, I say go with Eheim. They're a trusted brand. I like them. They've never, oh, 220 cold wood liters. Oh, 220 liters. Let's just do this. 220. Thank you, Cole. Cole's always looking out for us here. 220 
Let's do Siri. Siri's easier. Hey Siri, 220 liters equals how many gallons? Two. Oh, 58 gallons. Okay, 58 gallons. Thanks, Cole. Uh, so fit for, for, for 58 gallons, you're going to need to get 150 watt. One thing to note, and I, I don't know, I, I think most people know this. Beginners might not know it. Oftentimes, we think bigger is better. But when it comes to heaters, that's not the case. Um, because if a heater gets stuck in the on position, which I've heard horror stories that it happens. Never happened to me, but I've heard horror stories that heaters can get stuck in the on position, right? Well, first of all, if your heater gets stuck in the on position and, and you have a Bay Eye temperature controller, it doesn't matter because the Bay Eye temperature controller will kill the power. But if it gets stuck in the on position and you don't have a temperature controller and you buy a heater that is bigger, you're going to fry your inhabitants. So buy the right size. Don't buy a heater that's too big. Okay, so my first recommendation is the Eheim Jaeger. Um, somebody else was saying here, um, uh, let's see here. Uh, Eheim is cheap and durable. Don't buy eBay, Amazon cheap one. Uh, Philly, tell me, tell me more. Have you had bad experiences? Because I have bought this or Lushy one, and I also own the Via Aqua Quartz, and they work for me fine. So I haven't had a bad experience, but obviously I'm just, I'm just one here. Okay, so we talked about glass heaters, right? Then we have ceramic heaters. I don't know if this is ceramic heaters. I don't know why I call it a ceramic heater, but you have something like the Cobalt, okay? I have never owned this one because I have read reviews that these break, and when they break, they can break apart. I know some people love them, they use them, no problem. The good thing about this Cobalt Aquatics one is it's thin, whereas a glass heater is around like this, the Cobalt heater is like, is thin, so it can fit in different, different positions. Some people swear by them. I've never used them because I've heard some bad, some bad anecdote about them. Anyway, um, so that's with Cobalt, right? Then you have a titanium heater. Titanium heaters, uh, I know some people swear by them. I, I use titanium heaters. Um, I own a titanium heater and I'm going to be putting a titanium heater on the new Aquaforest Reef Octopus build. Um, they're durable, obviously. Titan it's made of titanium. It's not going to break. But you have to have a temperature controller because titanium heaters don't have the ability to turn on and off by themselves. So, for example, if you were to buy this titanium heater, if you, uh, yeah, if you had the ability to build this titanium heater, Oh, this is an Amazon one. Uh, this one comes with a temperature controller. So that's fantastic. If you buy your own titanium heater, it doesn't come with one, you, you're going you're gonna to have an ink bird or something more. So they're definitely more expensive. But if you're klutzy or if you know that you're just going to break a glass heater, then I'd recommend getting something like this. Then the fourth kind of heater, there's inline heaters. Basically, it would just, just imagine that you um, have like an external chiller where you have to plumb water goes into the chiller and out of the chiller. You can do the same thing with heaters. I've never seen anyone use one of these, but they definitely exist. Let's check check back and see how we're doing. Check out some comments here. Freaky Gollum redundancy. Somebody to consider for everything when possible. Assume all equipment will fail at one point. Yes. Redundancy is key. All equipment will fail. It, it just will. It, it will. And it will fail at the worst possible time. Time. Right. I mean, that's pretty much how it always happens. Philly says, Philly Iro says, I have that controller connected to the Apex with the Eheim Jaeger. Hey, you look exactly, exactly like I have, these, I have these names. I have the Apex. But um, you do have the controller. That's awesome. Um, it's a good controller, right, Philly? Um, I'm assuming I'm assuming it works really, really well for you. Let's see here. Philly, Bunny Ranger. Hi, Bunny Ranger. How are you, Kennedy? Good to see you here, Kennedy. Philly. Uh, Billy Cole Woods Rogue. I know someone who is in the freshwater side of the hobby has the old style green Eheim heater that is 22 years old and still running. Wow. So Eheim makes a good product. So yes, Eheim Jaeger, solid product. Louis Beats, 220 gallons. Oh, it is 220 gallons. Okay. And what do we have here? Uh, I know someone approximately three watts per gallon. And I have 1000 watt JBJ titanium heater. 
Philly says, I bought, I bought three 150 watt from Amazon. Not sure the brand, but cheap one. It was a three pack, three package, one crack within six months, one staying on more than their setting, and the other one just died. Oh, that's awful, Philly. So you have had some bad experiences with them. So you would recommend go with the Eheim because Eheim is still inexpensive. I mean, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's really, it's really quite inexpensive. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to... Let's go here already. I'm your host, Matthew, from My First Fish Tank. We are live every single Saturday morning, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time to answer all of your beginner questions. No question is too small, and will we repeat ourselves every week? Absolutely, but that's the point, because we're not here for ourselves. We're here for you, and we're here to answer your questions, no matter how simple they may sound to you. If I don't know the answer, we have a whole bunch of experts right over here in the chat who can help, and we can also jump onto our screen share. I have a lot of really good information on my website, and if my website doesn't have the information that you need, then we'll just do a little Google search, check the forums, and find the answer that way. If you can stay the whole time, great. If you can't stay the whole time, also okay. You can just ask your question in the comments right over here, and then check back later down into the comment, down into the description because what I'll do is I will type out every single question that was asked and put a timestamp. So all you got to do is click on the timestamp and then you can see the answer to your question. And then these live streams will remain up. Today's live stream number four or number five. So you can go back and check out whatever questions we've answered in the past. If you haven't done it yet, if you go ahead and like this video, that would be great. And also I wanted to tell you guys about a giveaway I know some of you already heard, already heard this. It was not your thing. Just ignore me for the next minute. But I'm sponsoring part of a $14,000, no joke, $14,000 saltwater aquarium giveaway. It is being hosted and run by my friend Rob over at Reef Stash. So here it is. Let me share, let me share my screen with you. Uh, it just started October 1st. It's running through, I believe, November 6th or November 8th. And... Uh, it is for a K tank and everything you need. Lights, RODI, corals. Really, really cool. Basically how it works is you go to the link and I'll put the link right here. And you sign, you have to give your name and your email, right? Because that's, I mean, if you're wondering why people like me run giveaways, we don't just run giveaways just to run giveaways. We run giveaways because it helps grow our channels. I mean, that's why we do it. So uh, this helps helps me out and hopefully somebody will win a really cool prize. So you go here, uh, I put the link down there, you sign up and then you just complete different tasks. And the more tasks you complete, the more points you get. And then you have a chance for winning what, what, what Reef Stash calls, and he might be right, the largest saltwater aquarium giveaway in history. No joke. So anyway, I'm really excited about it. Go ahead, go ahead and uh, check that out. Okay, that's enough of that sales pitch. Let's check back in with people here. Change to Eheim. Philly says, only my saltwater is using the controller. Only been using it for four months. So far, so good. I pair it with a small fan. Yep, so that's exactly what I do. I have a small fan and then I have it with a heater and it works fantastic. Remember that, man. Remember that. Remember, wait, remember what? I don't, I don't remember what you're saying. Only available for the USA. Yes, Freaky Goblin is correct. It is only available for the USA. And I asked um, Reef Stash why that was. He says because he hasn't found a, a US-based um, distributor, a US-based tank company that's willing to ship internationally. So far, everybody has said only shipping in the US. And the reality is in the English-speaking market, the US is just just dominates. If, if, if you look at my, like my YouTube analytics and you see who watches my, my video, I have a thousand views a day, right? Watch my videos. Um, I want to say 80% of those are from the U S and then 15% of those views come from Canada, the UK and Australia, and then every other country after that. Um, so he says he's working on it to find a company that's willing to ship overseas. So yes, hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to do a giveaway in the future that at least includes Canada and Mexico, at least. And if not, the UK and Australia as well. So that would be really, really cool. Oh, uh, Scott. Oh, Scott, are you not in? Oh, man. Freaky Goblin, are you not in the USA? Scott, are, are you not in the USA either? That's lame. I'm sorry. 
Uh, Philly, for the Bay Eye controller, the only thing I'm, I'm about is the metal tip on the probe. Dipped it in resave silicone. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that's a legitimate concern. So I would just recommend, um, if you can, just buy something like, like, like this, or like you said, dip it in silicone. And that works fine as well. Oh, Freaky Goblin, that's right, you're Germany. I knew, I, I knew you were Germany. Sorry, I'm sorry. Not shock, most giveaways, ways are entry limited. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I'd be curious, you know, like from my end of the giveaway with the RODI filter and, and t-shirt, like t-shirts and stickers, I could send to Germany really, really inexpensively, but I wonder how much shipping would cost for like a large RODI unit. Probably be pretty expensive. expensive. Are there any controllers, says Louis here, are there any controllers that support two heaters? Yes, let's show you. All right. I know Rogue Aquariums has one. Inkbird, I actually have one too. Um, they're not my favorite because I live in the desert and it's, re it's really, really hot here, so I don't ever need two heaters. But if you live in Canada or Alaska or somewhere that gets really cold, you might want to have two heaters. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so let's take a peek here. Two heaters. I think this one right here. No, wait. This one, this one, no, I don't. Metal probe. Okay, let's do Inkbird Aquarium Controller. Inkbird's always changing their line, so it's always really confusing. This one, this one here. This one here. Right here. I own this one. Okay, here we go. This one here, the Inkbird. I don't even know what brand it is. Here, I'll, let me, let me, let me just, let me add a link here. Uh, sign in. Sorry, oh, and I'm not even sharing. Well, that's okay. All right. Screen share. Here it is. Sorry for that. I don't know why I don't share my screen sometimes. So this is the only aquarium controller I know of that holds two heaters. You can't put a fan on it. All right, so just FYI, you it doesn't work for cooling. It only works for heating. So as long as that works for you, Louis Beats, um, then this temperature controller is the one for you. Works just fine. Click on that link there um, if you want. If you want any more about that one, excellent. Germany, Scott from Scotland. I don't know why I did that accent. That's not Scottish at all. Sorry, that's probably really insulting. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Hey, I'm so glad you're here, Scott from Scotland. That makes sense that, of course, you couldn't win. So I'm sorry. Sad face. Sorry, you're not going to win the $14,000 giveaway. I'm a breeder now. What? What? Why T for men? Tell me more. Tell all of us more. Clownfish? What? That's exciting. Oh, everybody. How is everybody doing today? We're almost... 50 minutes in already and very a few good questions already today by the way cole cole if you're still watching this cole uh when do you when do you get your your anemone prize i'm really really curious because when you get it i want to come over and see it uh my, my my friend cole here lives lives in the coachella valley with me and he won what kind of, of what kind of anemone was it if you're still watching um something gorgeous i bet and why haven't i changed there we go. So that's really cool. Yeah, I love it. Well, I can't wait to hear more about, about this. That's awesome. All right, does anybody have any questions? If not, let's find, or if a, a topic you want to talk about. We can also just talk about a topic and just kind of jam about some topics. That's fine as well if nobody has any beginner questions. If anybody has noticed, noticed by, um, for anybody watching right now, I have changed up my Instagram. And unless... Unless I follow you, I disabled direct messages. And it's just because I was spending a copious amount of time on Instagram. And I don't even like Instagram. I know. I'm sorry. I, I, even though I have a public persona being a, being a, being a YouTuber and doing this kind of stuff, I'm actually a very private person. And so I just, I don't like spending all that, all that time on Instagram. So I've actually turned Instagram over to my blogger, my social media director, my only employee that I have, Max, and he is actually the one running my Instagram now. Um, I will occasionally post stuff, but um, so if you DM, if you're if I followed you and you actually DM me, 
Uh, it's probably not gonna be me responding, it's gonna be Max responding. So you can just send me an email if you need to get a hold of me. That's a really good way to do it. It's just contact at myfirstfishtank.com and I get back to all the emails. So still a really good way to get a hold of me there as well. Um, and I've also uh, deleted my Facebook. So uh, for anybody who used to follow me on Facebook, I think I had 500 people on my Facebook page. Um, that's no more. So uh, I no longer have a Facebook account. Uh, I don't I don't get into why I did that, but I'm not gonna do Facebook anymore. So really it's just Instagram and YouTube are my only social media accounts right now. And of course, you can go to my website, you can contact me various ways that way. I have a storm pair. I had to pay 600, they must be a mated pair, right? $600, dang, $600? That is so expensive for a pair of clownfish. I hope those produce some crazy, crazy good babies for you. I can't wait to see. You better send pictures and certain stuff. Uh, YT Reeferman. You better send pictures of your setup. Send them to contact at I want to see, I want to see your setup. Big time. I'm super duper uber curious about that. Uh, Freaky Goblin, not just shipping, customs, tariffs, checking if it can be classified as a gift. Ugh, yes, Freaky Goblin. That sounds like a nightmare. That's probably one of the reasons why. Oh, oh, awful. Country differences in availability is interesting examples. Apex, hard to get a hold of, unless in the Netherlands. Haven't seen algae scrumbers. Now, Freaky Goblin, does the EU normalize all that stuff? I thought I thought one of the benefits of the European Union was that like tariffs and imports were kind of universally treated the same, but that's clearly not the case. So that's super annoying. Yes, I have a few of those. The Inkbird Bayite temperature controllers. Yeah, absolutely. Rogue Aquariums doing maintenance while I'm listening to your stream. Oh, thanks, Rogue Aquariums. I did. I dread doing my maintenance every week. I know. That makes me a terrible reefer. I dread it. So I did it yesterday. And that made me feel really happy because then I knew I was like free today, <laughs> which is awesome. Freaky Goblin. Here's a question if nobody else has one. Probes. Where do you place them? Consideration of coralline algae, etc. Now, probes, Freaky Goblin, are you talking about just temperature probes or pH probes, ORP probes? So typically when like, for example, the only probes I currently within the EU single market means anything inside. Oh, I see. So anything inside the EU can, but export. How oh, interesting. Didn't know that. Um, okay. Okay. Um, probes. I typically put my probes, and the only probes I currently use are temperature probes. And I put temperature probes um, not next to my heater in an area of high flow. So in my uh, in my 24 gallon reef tank that has a rear filtration chamber, it has like three sections, right? It has like the overflow section with mechanical filtration. It has this large center section, which you can put a protein skimmer, and then it has the return section. So I have my heaters in the return section, and I put the probe in the middle section, right? Uh, and so in my 40 gallon quarantine frag tank that has a sump, the sump has uh, chamber number one, filter sock, chamber number two is protein skimmer, then it goes into a bubble trap, and then into a return chamber. I have the heater in the return chamber, and I have the temperature probe in the section with the protein skimmer. I don't know if that answers your question at all, um, but that's where I put where I put, put my probes. Rogue Aquarium, same here. Yeah, they're a breeding pair. Oh, why you read from it? I'm so excited for you. It's okay, buddy. I have a brother in Houston. Oh, good. Oh, Scott. So... Your brother, maybe your brother could win, right? But I don't think he's gonna ship it to you. So uh, I think your your brother could win, which is awesome. But <laughs> I don't think your brother is nice enough to ship it to you to Scotland, right? I think that's gonna be um, thousands of dollars <laughs> to ship to Scotland. Uh, Louis Beats, I live in California, relocated. I'm located uh, the Palm Springs area, actually. Where where you said you're. You you said you said where you were somewhere in a town in in California, but I didn't know that town. Is it is it the Greater LA area? So yeah, I'm I'm Palm Springs area, Palm, Palm Desert, um, 
out here in the desert. It's still, yesterday was 109 degrees, everybody. 109 degrees. Today is supposed to be 107, 109 degrees. It's October. It's October and it's ridiculous temperatures outside. At least humidity is down to like, down to like percent and it cools off into the 70s at night. The 70s, I know, that's ridiculous. I'm excited about. <laughs> I can't wait to have our windows open all, all day. Um, within the EU, single market means anything inside can move without tariffs. Okay. Well, I don't see any more questions. 9.55. Doing well, everybody. How is everybody, everybody doing? Today? What should we talk about? Anybody have a good topic to talk about? Come out. I have... I have plans. I have plans coming together. So right now, out this way, this is our, our like outside deck area over here. Over here. Sorry, let me focus in on me. On me. There we go. Out here is our outside deck area, and uh, we live in a like a planned urban community. I think they call it just a, a gated community. It's, I swear, everywhere in Palm Springs, Palm Desert, like half half of every home feels like it's it's in a gated community. So ours is is no different. And uh, built in the 1980s, um, so any sort of like change you make to your house has to go through like an architectural committee. I'm sure anybody who lives in a condo or a townhome knows knows all about those things. But anyway, I am my wife and I are considering adding an office, and it's an office, but it's really my like YouTube fish studio, because um, right now I just have aquariums spread all throughout my house, and so we are working on some plans for making like this really cool indoor outdoor space and basically have an entire room just for my tanks and to do YouTube. So stay tuned for that. I'll share that with you guys as we go along. Um, I don't think we have the money to do it yet, to be honest, but I'm saving. Every every penny I'm saving right now that I'm not paying out to my employee, Max, is just going straight back into the business. So trying to save up enough money so that I can, I can build that extension, which we think would be amazingly cool. Scott Morrison, yes, he would, as he has his house house on it and then is moving everything back here. Oh, he's moving back to Scott. Oh, so maybe he would. Oh, that's fantastic. So then your brother is Scottish. He's not, not against you guys. You're both uh, from the UK. That's cool. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, Scott. World Aquarium 65 up in Seattle. I know. I'm jealous. Have you tried micro bubbling method, Philly? No. I mean, yes. No, um, I have accidentally filled my tank with micro bubbles, but I've never actually done like micro bubble scrubbing. And to be honest, I couldn't really tell you very, very much about it. Um, what its benefits are, if it's beneficial. I don't know if anybody over here has done micro bubbling or does it as a part of their maintenance routine. Could you tell us more? Um, I would be curious to know how often do you do it? Why do you do it? Do you do it at night? Do, do you do it during the day? day? Have you seen any benefits from doing micro bubbling? Um, let's actually look up here. Let's look up some micro bubbling. Micro, what, what should we search here? Um, micro bubble saltwater aquarium. Maybe that will help. Oh, micro bubbles, nano reef. Okay, total noob here. All right, so this is saltwater tank. And for people, most people find micro bubbles to be irritating. My LFS guy said that they can build up on the tissues of soft corals and kill the corals. Well, I don't know if that's true. We're talking about the general form today. Micro bubbles do pose risks in the reef aquarium. Seahorses can rot from the inside if they air inside their pouch. Some corals also suffer from micro bubbles. Okay. Uh, the main concern is for your corals. The bubbles in your pre-filter overflow should not be concerned. Just go with the bigger return pump. Most coral reefs are deeper than our tanks and air rises. A lot of the corals we keep live below micro bubbles caused by the waves. Uh, I would basically say a beginner tank or with hardier stuff, micro bubble issue is purely aesthetic. Personally, I have heard the bubbles would be more dangerous than the gills of fish. All right. So no idea if any of this is right, Philly. Let's see what else do we have here. Reef stable, reef sump. Does anybody have reef to reef? Let's check reef to reef. Micro bubble scrubbing, maybe reef to reef. The idea is to place lime wood or air stone near the return line with fresh air and blast display tank and many air bubbles, helping clean the coral and promote good bacteria. 
interested in this too. Is this reef scrubbing bubbles? Haha. <laughs> Appears to be a deep thread on this one. Uh, let's check this. I don't know. We are learning, anybody. We are learning about micro bubbles. You simply reply. Let's see here. Uh, oh, Randy, I'd like to thank you. Um, chemical, salt water, fresh water. This doesn't look like micro bubbles. This doesn't, doesn't look like at all. No. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I just doing some some really beginning research. I'm not sure. I would have to do a lot more research about micro bubbles. Um, so curious. Good idea, Phil. I currently do that as well. So rogue aquariums. I micro bubble at night to increase my pH. I'm assuming uh, rogue aquariums that when you micro bubble, you haven't seen any problems with your corals. Um, and do you do it just to raise pH? Does it have any other benefit other than, than, than oxygenating the water? I'm curious. I'm curious. All right. Fish room. Good topic. Fish room. Yes, YT Reeferman. A fish room. A fish room slash... Yeah, no, it's a fish room. I also want to make it into, like, my cigar lounge. Uh, but my wife, I don't think, will approve of smoking inside. Unless I get really, really good air, air filter. That's kind of my dream. Uh, but yeah, no, fish room. Fish room would be really cool. I'm. Can you imagine that? A fish room? Like, I know some people have a fish room, and I'm super jealous. And so if I had my own fish room, it'd be a small fish room. It'd be like a small bedroom, right? So we're not talking, like, big here. But still, like my own space with like big French doors that open out into this beautiful desert patio. So eight months of the year, I can just have this open and do all my filming and just fresh air all day long. It just sounds so amazing to me. Okay, good. Alrighty, good idea, Phil. Here's another topic when talking about redundancy, preparing for that power cut. Let's chat about that. I think that's a very, very good beginner topic. Temecula area. Hey, I was just in Temecula, Louis Beats. I was in Temecula at Riptide Creatures buying some fish a few weeks ago. All right. So we're going to go with Freaky Goblin here. Preparing for power cuts. How many of you guys that are currently watching, which is not, which is four, 14 people currently, just say yes or no. Do you have a backup plan in case of a power outage? I'm going to give you a sec. Right over here. Say yes or no. Be honest. All right? My answer, my answer, no, I don't. I mean, yes, I have a plan. And my plan is to panic, to run to Lowe's or Home Depot to buy the biggest generator they have for $1,000 and to quickly connect all my tanks. But I can't really call that a plan. That's a panic option. I have one bubbler, uh, one battery powered airstone. Okay, one battery powered airstone for four or five tanks. And I have one battery backup that can power J Bow or Reef Breeder pumps. That's it. So. Am I prepared? No. And is that a good thing? That's a terrible thing. I am a terrible, terrible example to this hobby. Um, so no, Dwight, no, no. YTV for me, no. Freaky Goblin, no. Okay, so I'm not alone. So okay, at least you guys are making me feel better knowing that I'm not the only one who is underprepared for this. The problem is, and I'm not, I'm not going to make excuses for it, but the problem is, when you spend thousands of dollars on this hobby, you know, when a new light can cost a thousand dollars, when, when a new tanks, new aquariums, new sumps, when your maintenance, your salt, when everything costs a ton of money, oftentimes you're like, oh, well, I only have a limited source of funds and I want to buy this piece of equipment or I want to buy this coral, right? And, and those things are sexy, right? A new piece of equipment for those of you equipment heads like myself, Mm, I just love, love new equipment or a new coral for those of you people who are coral fanatics. It's just like, oh, how can you say no? So we dump our money in to those things because buying a generator for $100 or buying battery air bubblers for $30 a pop 
or buying battery backup systems, which may never be used, are just not sexy purchases. But they are incredibly important purchases. So even though the answer for me right now is no, I do not. Over here in the, wait, what am I pointing over here? Over here in the future fish room, I am gonna have a built-in generator, meaning all of the power from the house is gonna run to a new box in the fish room. And then that box is gonna have a switch so that in a power outage, I can switch off power from the house and switch on power from a generator. So I'm gonna make sure that that fish room with a split air conditioning unit, with all the tanks, everything ha has a generator big enough to fully, fully support that room. But we're talking thousands of dollars. Like to do something like that is thousands of dollars. And for most people in this hobby, that's just not reachable. There are very few of us in this hobby who have the luxury like I do where my wife is the breadwinner and works full time and provides healthcare for the family so that her deadbeat husband, me, <laughs> can spend full time pursuing his passion and his hobby. There are very few people who are lucky enough to be in the position that I am. And because of that, I'm able to actually make some income doing this, right? But most people can't do that. So they're not gonna, they don't have thousands of dollars to spend. So at a bare minimum, what should you get in case of a power outage or when a power outage does happen? Get bat battery powered air bubblers. So let's see here, battery air stone. Okay, there's all sorts of ones out there. Here's one I have. Oh, what, the prices come down again? I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna buy several of these. Let me share my screen. This is a very good deal, everybody. In case, uh, in case you don't have it, I bought one of these a few weeks ago and it was twenty some dollars. Here's a link. Um, dang, look at that, look at that price. Is that really, really? Add to cart. Wow, super cheap. So I'm gonna add a couple of these to my cart here. <laughs> I'm actually gonna buy them. Uh, as soon as I get off this live feed, that's a re really easy good deal. So at a very at a bare minimum, power outage, have the bubble box, bubble box or something else, uh, because the thing that will kill the quickest, unless you live in the Arctic or in the Mojave Desert or Death Valley, okay, then temperature might be the killer. But if you live in a well insulated home, temperature will take a little while to increase or decrease. But what's going to kill your livestock? is they're gonna suffocate. Because, I'm sure everyone knows this, but where, how does oxygen, oxygen carbon dioxide, how, how are those gases exchanged? Well, they're only exchanged at the surface. And if your water surface is flat, no ripples, there's no possible area for gas exchange to occur. So you have to have something like an air bubble or a wave maker that runs on a battery constantly move water around so that there's surface agitation so that water and gas exchange can happen at the surface. That's what's gonna kill your livestock super quickly, right? Yes, temperature will also do that as well. Um, but generally speaking, that's that slow temperature you can control. For example, in the summer here, uh, if our power went out for 12 hours, I could take, and I've done it before, when my tanks get too hot, I just take ice packs and I float them in, you know, and that will cool the tank down enough. Um, yeah. Anyway, I hope that, hope that helps one. <laughs> oh, wow. Buying one too, YT reefer in? Yeah, I think that's smart. Okay. How are we doing here? New clown, drug aquariums. I think a lot of people should invest in a small air pump like the Cobalt DC. Works great. Bunny Ranger, my dad wants to know what the best saltwater fish are to start with. Also, what size tank and what kind of stuff should you put in it? Well, Bunny Ranger, that's a very good question. And I would tell your dad, who I happen to know actually, I would tell your dad, well, that's why I made this fantastic website, myfirstfishtank.com, right? So if you're wondering what kind of fish to get, just go to myfirstfishtank.com, go to beginner guides, and I have a whole thing about saltwater fish here. And it has 10, top 10 beginner saltwater fish, which is coming up in the middle of my page. And that's super annoying. I gotta fix it. So here's a saltwater fish to buy. And then if you're wondering, hey, 
what kind of tank should I get? Well, my, my blogger, Max, has been diligently working on updating all of the aquarium setup guides. He's already, oh my God, Matthew, Matthew, share your screen. He has already updated all of the low budget builds, which are fantastic. He did this really cool $220 super cheap budget build. Um, this one's Inappropriate Reefer. I don't know if you've seen his tank. He broke it down. It was like $147 tank he built. Amazing. So super cheap, right? So tell your dad, uh, uh, Bunny Ranger, that he can just go here to my aquarium setup guide and he can check here. Max is currently updating the high budget builds. Okay, so if you click on them, you'll notice they're not quite done yet, right? He has the layout done, but some of the pictures haven't been uploaded yet. Okay, just FYI. So that's what I would do for anybody looking at starting their first saltwater fish tank. Tons of good information right there. Okay. No, no big Okay. I think a lot of people, yes. What Hannah checkers are a must have? Hmm. I know which ones I think are must have, so let's check them out. Hannah checker. So, okay, saltwater side. I don't know freshwater side. Saltwater side, Hannah makes, makes, well, they're making a nitrate. It's not for sale yet, but I'm actually getting a preview copy from Marine Depot. Thanks, Marine Depot, if anybody's watching. Uh, it was in the, they sent it Friday. So I'll have a preview copy. I'll show you guys next week, maybe. Um, I'm actually excited about it. One of the benefits of, of this job is that I get I get advanced things sometimes. So it's kind of really exciting, especially for someone like me who just loves gear. Okay, so they have a nitrate checker. Low range nitrate checker right here. Here it is, 50 bucks. Not for sale yet, but almost for sale. Low range nitrate checker. They have an alkalinity checker. They have a calcium checker. They have a low range phosphate and an ultra low range phosphate checker. So that's five. They have a pH checker. And then what? Iron, copper, chlorine. Uh, they have an ammonia, but that's only fresh water. So if I was to say, what are the essential HANA checkers? Okay. I, okay, I'm going to put it in a couple of things here. The ascent, if you were to buy one Hannah checker, all right, Louis, this is just my opinion. I would buy the phosphate checker. Um, phosphate test kits are a little bit more all encompassing. So if you get like a Red Sea phosphate test kit, it takes a little bit more to set up and Phosphates, it's, it's, you really want to want to have a low amount of phosphates, not zero, but not like 0.15. You want to have like 0 0.07, 0 0.08, right? If you are just using a standard phosphate test kit where you have a vial and you're just comparing, you're not going to be able to determine the exact number. It might look like zero. It might look like 0.2. And in the world of phosphate, that's a really big difference. So I like the phosphate checker. Um, you have to shake the vial for two minutes and then it takes three minutes to test, but it gives you a super accurate reading. I don't know what the accuracy is, it's plus or minus, but it's a really good reading. So my number one choice for a HANA checker would be phosphate. My number two choice, if it works, I'm assuming it's gonna work, but I haven't tried it yet would be the nitrate checker, which is being released soon. Here's the nitrate checker. Now I'm, ass I'm assuming it works well. If it doesn't work well, I'll let you guys know, but I'm assuming it works well because Hannah typically makes a good product. And the reason you want to do a nitrate checker is again, when you're using an API, a Red Sea, a Seachem, a Salaford, a Nios, whatever test kit you're using, it's gonna be difficult to tell if your vial is zero, if it's 0.1, if it's 0.25 right? So, and you don't want your nitrates to be zero, just like you don't want your phosphates to be zero, but you don't want your nitrates to be too high either. Although some people have success with high nitrate and high phosphate tanks, right? People shoot for some, some low middle ground, I don't know, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, somewhere around there. And it's hard to tell. So a nitrate test kit, like 
like the Hannah Checker is probably going to be a really, 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 really good purchase. So I would say purchase your phosphate, then purchase your nitrate, then I would say purchase the alkalinity checker. You get the calcium checker too, but as long as you're doing water changes, your calcium and alkalinity should rise and fall relatively at similar levels. So if you, if you only check one, check the alkalinity because the alkalinity test kit is the easiest test kit they have. You fill it once, you put it in the checker, you press the button, they put one milliliter of the reagent in there and you put it back in and it like immediately tells you the alkalinity level. So typically once you know the alkalinity level, you can deduce, induce, induction, or I don't know if this is induction. In, I, think this, I think this would be induction, induction. You would induce what the calcium levels were. Say phosphate number one, nitrate number two, alkalinity number three, and then calcium number four. Those would be my recommendations. Uh, yeah, and uh, Freaky Goblins is alkalinity. Yeah, the thing you have to ask yourself, which ones are you using most often? Yeah, I typically use, I, I test for um, phosphate and nitrate until they're stable because uh, right now I have a dino flagellate and a cyano outbreak. It's not terrible, but in my 40 gallon breeder tank. So I'm testing every day for nitrate and phosphate, and phosphate until I can really dial in exactly what those levels are. But then alkalinity, absolutely. You're going to test for alkalinity all the time. All right. Hope that was helpful there, Louis Beats. 10, 15 already, only 45 minutes left. Now it's time for a commercial break. Hey everybody, my name is Matthew from My First Fish Tank and you have reached the, wait for it, desk. I am here, I am here every single Saturday morning, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. to answer your beginner questions. If you can stay the whole time, that's fantastic. If you can't, you can just stop by. It's a drop-in. Ask your question over here in the chat and then come back later today or tomorrow tomorrow because I, I will have updated a description down below with every single question and a timestamp. So you just click on the timestamp and you can see an answer to your question. If I don't have the answer, we are lucky enough over here in the chat to have all sorts of sorts of bird opinions who will chime in and help us. And then if we need to, we can just jump onto our handy dandy screen share and look up the question live. And if we just don't know the answer, we'll find it. We'll find the answer. If you guys could do me a favor and go ahead and give this video a, a thumbs up, that would be super duper awesome. Okay, commercial over. Let's get back to the questions. Oh man, my voice is <coughs> it's going a little today. It's a lot of talking. I use peroxide oxygen generator on all my tanks. What? Allen248. What is a peroxide oxygen generator? I have never heard of that. Let's type it in. Peroxide peroxide oxygen generator? Generator. I've never heard of that. Oxygen generator. What? What in the world? Catalytic oxygen generation from hydrogen peroxide? Oxygen is generated when hydrogen peroxide breaks down and oxygen and water on contact with catalase, an enzyme found in liver. To protect itself, I've never heard of this method. I don't think anybody in the saltwater aquarium hobby uses this, except you. That's amazing. Clean water store. Freight tanks. My trident test my main. I have, have you guys ever heard of this? An oxygen. Obviously, this is a very, very expensive solution, but it appears is that there exists this thing. Thank you, Alan248, for turning us on to this. Called, called a peroxide oxygen generator, which converts hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water. That's amazing because for somebody who really struggles with low pH or is in a really dank environment with a lot of carbon dioxide, that can be a really interesting solution for oxygenating your tank. So, wow, I'm gonna do a little bit more research on that. That's really interesting. I've never, ever heard of something like that before. Alrighty, freshwater tanks. I remember when you were helping me setting up my tank, yeah. I can't wait for those pictures, YT Reeferman. I'm looking forward to getting those pictures. Let's see, and I can't wait until you can, maybe, maybe you can make a deal for some of your future, some of your future uh, storm clowns, hmm? 
maybe. I'm actually, I am considering more and more, and I've been talking to some of you guys who are watching, what s livestock to put in my new reef octopus build. And it's, and I'm, I'm thinking of doing something, something I think will be risky, risky. And I've been doing a lot of research and I think it's possible, but it's gonna take a really close watch that I can step in and make changes if it doesn't work. Because the the new Reef Octopus Lux 90 is a 48 gallon display with, I, I'm, I'm assuming a 20 gallon, there's gonna be 20 gallons in total water volume in the sump, something like that. And I am thinking of doing a clownfish harem tank. Uh, now, before you say that's a bad idea, before you say don't do it, you may be right. You may be right. But I have been watching a lot of videos. Bulk Resupply has it. There's been some really good forums that I've been reading about. People recommending a minimum tank size of 75 gallons. You know, you have to feed them a lot. You need to spread out the aggression. And the only reason I'm considering doing it with a 48 gallon tank, and I'm considering doing somewhere between seven and 10 clownfish. Ocelaris or Percula, some people recommend Percula clownfish for this, is because the 48 gallon tank is a long tank. If it was a cube, I probably wouldn't try it because there's not enough space in a cube to spread out the aggression. But in a longer tank, if I scape it correctly with a lot of hiding places and nooks and crannies, there may be enough space for that aggression to spread out, especially when I add in a lot of anemones. But the trick is, if I end up doing a clownfish harem tank with seven to 10 clownfish, I have to be ready to step in immediately if the experiment goes south, if, if the aggression is not being spread, if I notice a uh, uh, clownfish getting picked on, picked on. You know, it'll be one thing as well when they're really, really small clownfish, but as they grow to their full size, that could change the, the aggressiveness. So it's gonna be interesting. I'm I'm still doing research, but I, I, I'm feeling like that's what I'm gonna try. Knowing that I may have to remove the clowns at any moment and figure out what to do with them. Um, so we'll be, we'll, be, we'll be interested. We'll be interested in that. Um, I'll keep you guys tuned here. King Julian, what's an easy way to hatch cleaner, cleaner shrimp? King Julian, I have no idea. I know people have had success hatching peppermint shrimp. Um, I've never done it. Let's look it up real quick. I have no idea. Boom, screen share. I'm going to remember this time. Um, how to hatch peppermint shrimp. How to... Breeding, that's what I'm looking for, algae barn. Breeding peppermint shrimp. Oh, algae barn has some info here. This could be a good link here. Hi, Heatwave Reefer, how are you? Breeding peppermint shrimp, here we go. I'll put a link in here. Here's a link for you. Uh, this is for King Julian. What's an easy way to hatch cleaner shrimp? Candy cane shrimp, most popular, the parents. It says, first, you have to establish your breeding quality. Candy cane shrimp are notoriously cannibalistic and aggressive towards one another. So do not expect every single one you buy to survive. It looks like there's a lot of good stuff here, King Julian. Um, the breeding tank, tank, larva hatching, the lar larval tank, how to raise larva, larval stages. Now, this just looks like a general overview, King Julian, uh, but this might be a really good place to start. So check it out, check it out. Aptasia anemones. Hmm. Cool, yeah, well, there you go. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go too much into it, into it but maybe start there and see how it goes. I use Freaky Goblin Hannah Checker for, I use them in all my frag tanks. My Trident test my main display six times, six times. Yeah, that's awesome. On my two frag tanks, I test ALK three times weekly, PO4 two times a week, calcium one time, yeah. Heatwave Reefer, hello Heatwave Reefer. Another Coachella Valley resident. Heatwave Reefer, are, are you as sick and tired of this summer as I am? Are you sick of it? I'm so sick of it. Like, so over 107, 108 plus. 
<laughs> I'm assuming you are too up there. You're in Desert Hot Springs, right? Alrighty. Yes, you are. Okay, yeah, you're, you're sick of it too. Soaching Oxidator D. I don't do that. I live in Florida and the power goes out quite a bit. Plus we have hurricanes and bad thunderstorms. Cool. Uh, that is super cool, Alan. I'm really glad you brought that peroxide generator to to all of us because I've, I've never... Um, are there affordable ones out there or do they just cost over $1,000? Uh, I'd be curious to know for sure. King Julian, you're welcome. Have fun with that. I think it's a really cool idea. I know a lot of people breed shrimp. Uh, peppermint shrimp are some of the easiest to breed. I don't know if anybody breeds like fire or uh, skunk cleaner shrimp. If you could breed those, oh my goodness, you'd make some money because those are awesome. Peppermint shrimp, I stay away from them. From them. Peppermint shrimp and I, and I are, we're not friends. They, I had one attack my coral and I was not happy with, with that peppermint shrimp. So that's probably terrible because I'm now despising all peppermint shrimp because of the actions of one peppermint shrimp, but peppermint shrimp. Oh, I ordered mine from Shrimp Tank. Brenton Cano says, can't can't decide between two AI Prime 16 HD or the Ecotech Radeon XR15 for the IM Lagoon. Any thoughts, recommendations? Well, of course. Let's take a peek here. Let us go to the IM Lagoon. What is it? The IM Lagoon tank. So it's two feet by two feet by one one foot, basically. Uh, good question. I mean, I I think I know the answer for you. Let's see. Is is this the one, Brenton? Is this one you have? Let's see. Where are the twenty three twenty? Yeah, this is the one you have right here. So two feet. Uh, here you've heard, I've heard of the fan. All right, two feet, here we go. Okay, right, so here's a foot, right? So two feet, what, here? I gotta go halfway. Here, here, okay, so this is about two feet right here. Okay, right, right there is two feet. So, basically, now this is my understanding, okay? I believe that Ecotech and Aqua Illumination are this company now. Is that correct? Am I correct? I, I think I'm correct. They're, they're owned by the same company. I think I'm right. And I'm doubting myself, but I think I'm right. Uh, Aqua Illumination being a more affordable option than, uh, than Ecotech. Does Ecotech make the highest quality LED lights in the hobby? Yes. Yeah. I don't think there's much dispute there. There might be some small manufacturers um, who can manufacture really good ones. I just don't know about, but typical opinion in this hobby is Ecotech makes the best LED light available. Do you pay the most for it? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the question is, is for this two foot tank, what should you do? I think it's going to come down to, to your budget and kind of what your goals are. I own, I have owned the XR15s and I currently own the HD16. And I use the AI HD16 or 16HD, whatever they call it, on a 10 gallon Innovative Marine tank. I use it on Innovative Marine Encore tank, one of my two sides. The one side has a Kessel A80 Tuna Blue, the other side has the AI Prime 16HD. Um, and I love the AI Prime 16HD, I love it. Uh, is the fan loud? I mean, no, I, I have not found it to be noticeable. I mean, can you hear it sometimes? Yeah. If you, if you have the intensities up all the way, but it's not, it's not very loud. Um, I don't think in, in, in my opinion, and it's super programmable. It's easy to use. I like the AI app and it's affordable, you know, at $210 plus amount, you're looking at under $250 for that. How much is the XR15 Pro right Pro right now? XR15. Okay, so it's four hundred and twenty dollars plus amount. So you're looking at four fifty. You're looking at two hundred dollars more. That's significant. And is it worth it? Well, well, uh, Brenton, if if money's not a huge consideration, um, 
I mean, if you're going to get two AI Prime 16s or one Ecotech, well, then I just go with the one Ecotech. Uh, Ecotech, the 15, has a has it has a bigger spread, right? If 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 you're looking at the AI Prime, I wish I had it here. This is about this is about size of the head, right? Of the AI Prime, so it's 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 quite small. And not only that, uh, the AI Prime, you know, all the lights are are clustered in a, in a pretty small space like this. So if you're putting it over a two foot tank. Sorry, if this is your tank, right? And you're putting it over a two foot tank. You might have to raise it up a little higher to get a decent spread, right? But if you're going with an XR15, it's it's not this size, but it's probably like this size. So it is a little bit bigger, right? And the, the LEDs aren't clustered together nearly as tightly. So you are going to get a better spread, but it's not going to be like a super huge spread. And it's really going to depend on what you're gonna put on the tank, you know? Because if you know that you're just gonna get, let's say you're gonna get two poop lights, well, if you get two primes, two prime 16s, you put them like this, you're gonna have a really good spread. The center is, is gonna highest par because the two fixtures are gonna come together and meet, you know? But you're gonna have a relatively good par all the way around the edges. If you just go with one XR15 over the middle, you're gonna have really high par in the middle and then the edges aren't going to have as much par. But that's totally fine. You know, because if you if you build Aquascape in such a way that you know you're only going to have one light fixture, then you can just make sure that you build it so it doesn't cast any huge shadows, and then you can put whatever sort of high light corals, whether those are SPS corals, in the center, and your low light corals can go around towards the edge. So at the end of the day, it's price point wise they're going to be really comparable you know if you end up going with two prime 16s you're probably going to end up spending a little bit more money than just one xr15 um and you're going to have relatively the same success you're just going to have a different spread xr15 one one light spread all, spread all around two or two primes with a, a better coverage um really there's no there's no better choice here you just have to go with what's gonna fit your needs and your stocking plans into the future. Okay, hope that helped. Oh man, 30 minutes left everybody. All right, all right, commercial break. My name's Matthew, my first fish tank and welcome to the... We're here every single, every single day, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time and we're here for you, the beginner, to answer your beginner questions. You can come by and stay the whole time and chat with us, or you can just drop by, ask a question, and then come back later because I will type out every question and put a timestamp on so you can just go down to the description below, click on that timestamp, and find the answer to your question. If I have the answer, I'll give it to you. If I don't have the answer, we have a whole bunch of experts right over here in the chat who are more than willing to help. And if none of us know, we will just jump up onto screen share and we will find the answer together. If you could please give this a thumbs up, that is also super duper helpful. And, and I want to tell you guys about the $14,000 saltwater aquarium giveaway that's going on that I am doing, that I am partly sponsoring. If this ain't your thing, just ignore what I'm about to say. But Reef Stash is the one putting this together. It is valued at over $14,000. And according to Robert Reef Stash, it is the largest saltwater aquarium giveaway ever. No joke. If you are interested in signing up for it, it is free. You have to be, it's only available in the US. You have to be 18 and only one entry per household. Basically how it works, click on the link, you sign in, and then you complete tasks or not. But the more tasks you complete, the greater chance you have of winning. And tasks are things like subscribe to my first fish tank, sign up for this. Yes, I know some people hate this sort of thing. So if you hate this sort of thing, don't do it. This is my first time sponsoring something like this. Um, I'm sponsoring it by giving away an RODI filter, some t-shirts, some stickers, and then I will make a video for the winner featuring their tanks so that they can kind of have that for that for their own thing that's a little bit polished kind of in my style. That's what I'm giving away. But the Cade tank itself is thousands of dollars. It comes with, I mean, it's, it's, it is an amazing giveaway. Um, why would someone like me sponsor this? 
I sponsor this because it helps raise awareness of my first fish tank. It helps direct people to my website, it helps direct people to my Instagram, it helps direct people to my YouTube. So that's why I sponsor something like this, just in case you're wondering. Okay, uh, by the way, the giveaway only runs, and of course I didn't screen share because I am some sort of idiot here. It runs for about 40 days. So I believe it, believe it runs through, through, when does it run through? November? November? November 8th, something like that. Okay, but you can see over here, here's all the sponsors, and where, where am I? My first fish tank right there, on the right-hand side. And then these are all the things you can do. If you share this giveaway, you get points, join Algae Barn, see here. Uh, subscribe to My First Fish Tank YouTube channel, you get points, stuff like that, right? Really cool giveaway. Um, Rob, who's running this, uh, you can follow him as well. He is R Reef Stash. Um, he actually won the 10 thousand dollar water box giveaway that happened earlier this year or last year and it got him kind of really excited about this so he's uh, running this so you can check him out as well okay let's get back to it everybody we got 25 minutes left 25 more minutes so if you have a question now is the time to ask your beginner question so that we can get that answered uh, heat wave reefer, the new ones are a little loud. Not bad in my bedroom. Okay, so heat wave reefer has said that the AI primes are a little bit loud in his bedroom. Not too bad, but noticeable. Good to know. Uh, Rogue Aquariums, yes. Reef Bright, yes. Yeah, Rogue Aquariums is a big fan of Reef Bright. I've never owned Reef Bright, but uh, he swears by him. By him. Tanks were gorgeous, so I would say that's amazing. I just ordered a Reef Bright. Hey, you did. I have mine eight inches over water line on my lagoon. One prime has a good spread. That's good. My tank is mixed. I had two on my tank when I had SPS worked well. Brenton Cano, thank you. Plan to do a, do a mixture well. Yeah, you're going to be fine with either one. Non-SPS is good. Heat Wave can't wait to win, Brenton. When will the next episode of the Reef Octopus Tank come out? Friday. So, for those of you who follow me, which I assume most of you do, but I have, let's see here. Playlist, you guys see a little back end, a little, little sneak peek into here. Playlist, let's see, where is it? Aquaphor Spotlight, here it is. We have two videos done so far on the Aquaphor Spotlight. First one, we talk about the gear. It's like basically a glorified unboxing video. And then another one, second two, talks about the tank. We put the stand together and do the tank. Episode three is going to be the gear. We're going to put the gear together, the sump, uh, put the baffle in, Look at uh, the protein skimmer, the return pump, the wave makers, the lights, the heater. We're going to install all the gear. And uh, I'm doing this series for Coral View. And Coral View, we're doing 10, 10 parts with them. And so we're doing a video every other week. So episode two came out at my first fish tank and Marine Depot a week ago. Uh, Coral View hasn't released theirs yet. Um, they will. And then the next episode, I'm going to film Monday and then edit Tuesday and Wednesday so that it can go live a week from today, Friday. So just, they should be coming out every other week. There might be some, like a week skipped here or there, but yeah. So what would that be? Friday. Oh, I haven't switched my calendar yet. Friday the 9th. Friday the 9th. So there you go. Oh, King Julian. How often... Do we need to change the RODI <clears throat> water filters? Excellent, excellent question. And, and of course, the answer, just like everything in this hobby, is that depends. Right? It depends on how frequently you use it and what your water source and water quality is. All right? So let's talk about each filter individually. Let's start with the sediment filter. Okay? A sediment filter, just change it when it looks dirty. Sediment filters catch large particulate matter. So once it looks dirty and starts to, to brown, I, don't, I mean, some people could change it once a year. Some people might have to change it every quarter. Um, it just depends. Once it starts to brown, they're super cheap. You know, they're like less than $10. So, I mean, I would probably change it quarterly to once every six months or as necessary. All right. Uh, when it comes to carbon, what's actually... Let's look that up. Now, again, if you don't use your filter very often, um, then it, it's, not, it's not really that big of a deal. Uh, but then how are you supposed to know? Like there is no test to tell when your 
carbon filter gives out. So how often change carbon filter RODI? Let's look it up. Six months, according to Reef to Reef. A good rule of thumb is to replace your sediment filter and carbon blocked after six months. A more precise way to maximize the life of these two filters is to use a pressure gauge to identify when pressure reaching, reaching the membrane starts to decline. So that's actually a really good idea. So what they're saying there, if you're using a pressure gauge, so if you install a brand new sediment filter, right? Check what your pressure is, your water pressure is. And then as long as your water gauge is measuring the water pressure after the sediment filter, obviously it has to be after the sediment filter, as your water pressure goes down, that means your sediment filter is getting clogged. And then I would change the sediment filter and the carbon. So change the sediment filter and the carbon block together uh, would be my recommendation there. Then your RO membrane, as long as you're flushing it, if you're flushing it before and after to, to kind of get rid of that TDA creep, whatever those total dissolved solids are, which are typically salts. If you're flushing it, they can last for two, three years. Let's, let's, let's do a share again. How often change RO membrane every two years? Okay. Two years, according to what is this? This is some, some home filtration company, water tech reef to reef two years. I mean, two years is probably fine. I, I, I mean, the way, the way I measure when to change your RO filter is by measuring TDS. Okay. So what, what my RODI filter has is it has a dual inline TDS meter meter. And one of those inline TDS meters is placed immediately after the RO membrane. The second TDS meter is placed at the end product water. Okay. So what I can measure then is obviously I want my end product water to always be zero TDS, but the water coming out of your RO membrane probably won't be zero. Mine typically is two, three, four, somewhere around there. Very, very low TDS. But I know, for example, I just checked it yesterday. It's three, right? My TDS after my own RO membrane is three. So if, if that's going up to five, six, I know that my RO membrane probably needs to be changed. Now I actually have two RO membranes that run my system so that I can serve more water and produce a lot more product water. So uh, every two, three years, if you don't use it very much, but if you have an inline TDS meter, you can just monitor the product water coming out of your RO membrane to tell you when it's time to change your RO membrane. And lastly, for your TDS, sorry, for your DI resin, how often should you change that? I highly recommend purchasing color changing DI resin because then you know exactly when to change it. So uh, it's really easy. You can buy it in bags. You can buy it already, already stuff. So color changing DI. This is what I buy. I buy this one right here. Bulk color changing deionization resin. 13 bucks. It's good enough for one DI canister. As long as you, as long as you own a DI canister that, that, that you can remove it, you just buy this stuff and it turns to this very light brown color when it's done. So that's when you, that's when you know, change that. All right. Hope that was helpful for you. All right. Questions. Mark Louis. -Wee. Hey there. Singapore, right? Wait, Singapore. Are you in Singapore, Mark? Thanks for joining us. What time is it in Singapore? Like you're like 12 hours different. It's 1045 here in, in California. Okay. Freaky Goblin, Aquamedic have a resin filter which changes color to indicate when it needs changing. Yes, Aquamedic does, Bulk Reef Supply does, Marine Depot Clean Water does, PureTech does, pretty much all of them have it. But obviously, if you buy color changing resin, you have to get a clear canister, right? So if you buy one of the, like, one of the RODI systems that has white canisters, it's pointless to have a color changing resin because you can't see the color change, right? Oscar Cervantes. Welcome, Oscar. How are you? How much should I, I feed a pair of clownfish in a 20 gallon tank? Great question. Uh, I have had success feeding clownfish anywhere from once a day to four times a day. 
Uh, clownfish might have done well. Once a day, I feed them, make sure they eat for a couple minutes, and that works totally, totally fine for a pair of clownfish. I now feed all of my fish two times a day because I have Antheus uh, and a, uh, a fox face, which, which kind of likes to peck at food all day, so I make sure I feed them pretty heavily twice a day. If you, uh, want, you want your fish to breed, I, it doesn't sound like you have a breeding tank, I believe you feed them at least like four, time, four times a day because they need to be well fed in order for that breeding instinct to turn on. But I mean, clownfish are amazing, amazing creatures. I mean, I, if I was to recommend it, I would say feed them, feed them twice a day. Feed your clownfish twice a day, as much food as they can eat in a couple minutes. Um, and, that, and that's a really good baseline. They can survive on once a day. They can survive obviously on more food. But I think twice a day is probably a really good amount. Whatever you feed them, mine like different kind of pellet food, mine like flake food, uh, mine like mysis shrimp, mine like brine shrimp, mine like uh, reef caviar, mine, I, mine, mine will eat anything. Like no joke, mine, mine will eat anything. So I like to just mix it up so that they kind of eat all sorts and a variety of foods. Brenton, sorry for all the questions. Brenton, you don't need to apologize. That's why we're here. Like I'm literally here for two hours every week to answer questions. So please don't apologize. Ask away. Last one, I promise. What is the deciding factor when choosing four, five, six, or seven stage RODI filter? Heatwave Reefer uh, has a very good answer, and that's a good partial answer. So, a four stage filter is your standard filter. It has a sediment filter, a carbon block, RO membrane, and DI resin. Okay, those four things put together are the heart of every single RODI filter with the goal of produ producing zero TDS. Now, within a four stage filter, you're going to have certain limitations. For like example, a standard four stage filter needs good water pressure. I mean, at least 40, you know, at least 40, um, well, I don't even, what's the measurement? Pounds per PSI, 40 PSI, I don't even know what the measurement is for water. At least 40 PSI, uh, but upwards of 70 is even better, okay? So you, it's, it's assuming you have good water pressure. Uh, it's also assuming that your water source is not loaded with chlorine and chloramines, that it has a normal amount. Because when you're thinking about it, a sediment filter reduces sediment, pulls out large particulates. Your carbon filter reduces and traps chlorine and chloramines. So if you have a ton of chlorine and chloramines, like a lot of water districts do in Southern California, that carbon filter will be used up to capacity really quickly. Then it moves to your RO membrane and RO membranes uses um, pressure to reverse osmosis so that water will pass through the membrane and the large particulates will stay behind, right? But if you live in an area with high TDS, hard water, right? With a lot of dissolved solids in your water, 160, some places in California have 400 TDS, which just blows my mind, right? then if you, that RO membrane is going to get covered and there's gonna be trapped salts in there and TDS, and eventually it's just not gonna push through that clean water effectively. And then lastly, of course, you have your, your, your D resin, which has anion and uh, cation, I don't even know the name of them, different kinds of resins, which are going to attract whatever leftover salts, whatever leftover TDS there is, okay? So when we're considering adding on more stages to a four stage RODI filter, it really depends on what your needs are. needs are. For example, if you live in an area that doesn't have a lot of chlorines and chloramines, but you know that there's a lot of silt in your water because let's say you're on a well system, maybe you need to have two sediment filters that you change out all the time because you know sediment is your biggest area, this is your biggest area of weakness. If you, you live in Southern California in a water district that's just tons of chlorine and tons of chloramines, then maybe you need to upgrade your system to a five stage and your fifth stage needs to be an additional carbon stage, right? Because you can buy specialized carbon that is, that is really effective at trapping chlorine and chloramines, right? So, so that could be what your fifth stage is all about. If, if you want to conserve water like heat wave re reefers, right? Or if you need to make more RODI water or make the RODI water quicker, then you're going to add a fifth stage and it's gonna be an RO membrane. 
because it saves water because what can happen is you can attach the first RO membrane into the second RO membrane so that the wastewater from the first RO membrane, which yes, is gonna have more TDS, gets passed through the second RO membrane and gives that second RO membrane a chance to filter out. So effectively, you're gonna cut your wastewater in half and not only that, but you're gonna double the output from 100 or 90 gallons to 180 or 200 gallons per day. And then the last consideration, if you're considering expanding your RODI filter, is with your DDI resin. If you live in an area, again, <clears throat> with, with high TDS, then you might wanna consider getting a second DI resin canister. For example, my system I have, I have, I had a four stage, I added a fifth, six, I have a seven stage system. One sediment filter, one carbon block, then it goes through two RO membranes so that I save water and produce a ton more RODI product water. And then it goes through two DI resin containers because I live in an area with a rel you know, relatively high TDS and I make a lot of water. So my color changing DI resin changes really, really quickly. So sorry, that's kind of a lengthy, lengthy answer. Um, I, I hope, hope that helped explain it. If you have a small system, you're probably just fine with a four stage. You just need to cons consider if you need more, then you need to consider what stages that you're going to need to add. Okay. Sorry, that was a long, long answer there, Brenton. Mark Louis, yes, 12 hours heat wave. I feed my clowns once a day. Yep. Once a day works fine. Oscar, thank you. You're welcome, Oscar. Rogue Aquariums, they're 15 hour difference. Oh my gosh. That's a long, that's a long difference. Scott Morrison. Give him a like, guys. He's a decent guy. Hey, thanks. That's really kind of you, Scott. I appreciate that. If you could give this a like, I would appreciate it. Freaky Goblin, I'll say goodbye. Take care. Happy Reef and Freaky Goblin. Have a wonderful day over on the continent. Thank you for tuning in from Europe. I really appreciate that. That's awesome. Mark, Louis, we. Hi, Matthew. I st still didn't resolve my issue on my tank about ick. Can I do hyposalinity in my Fowler? Do I need another 10 gallon tank to do hyposalinity? And then nitrobacteria. Okay, so let's, let's look at this, Mark. Let's look at um, options for treating ick. So I'm gonna share my screen. Let's go to my beginner guides, okay? Um, there are all sorts of options for curing ick, and you're just gonna have to choose the one or the ones that um, that suit your setup the best. So here we go. We're gonna look at fish disease. Alrighty. Let's go age, how to prevent fish disease, quarantine tank, dips, keep stable, remove, aggressive. Loss of appetite, flashing, yes, 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 yes. Bacterial, fungal, parasitic, parasitic. Okay, marine ick, here we go. Here we are, marine ick. Common white spot disease, saltwater ick, of course. Cryptocarion irritants, I'm sure that's a really terrible pronunciation. Symptoms, yes, treatments. Okay. So, uh, Mark, treatment options. Probably the, considered the gold standard treatment for ick is some sort of copper, whether that's cupramine, whether that's copper safe, some sort of chelated copper, copper. Okay, I think I recommend cupramine. There are other good brands out there. Copper can, can only be used in a fish only system. Copper will kill inverts. It will kill your corals, it will kill your crabs, it will kill your shrimp, okay? So copper is best administered and really it should only be administered in a quarantine slash hospital tank without a biological filter, without live rock and without sand because some people think that live rock and sand can actually absorb some of that copper that can be slowly leached out over time. So if you're able to, you can use copper if your system's set up that way. You need to be careful though, because there are some species of fish that don't respond well to copper because copper, what, what you're doing with copper is you're poisoning the fish. Okay. Let's, let's not beat around the bush here. You're adding poison into the water, but the understanding is that the poison, the ick, hates the poison much more than the fish hate the poison. So the fish can tolerate 
a level of poison while the ick not. Okay. So if you have a fish only system without live rock, without sand, you can use cupramine copper. Sometimes by the time you notice ick outbreak, it sometimes can be too late because if you add copper into a tank, you do it slowly over, over a period of days, you're adding another stressor onto those fish and an additional stressor could kill them. But there's really nothing, nothing you can do that. Okay. So gold standard for sure. What else do we have here? The tank transfer method is also another option. The tank transfer method means you need to have at least two tanks. And I have a, um, I'll give you a brief description of it. Ba basically how the tank transfer method works is you beat out the ick life cycle by moving your fish from one sterile tank to another sterile tank every few days. And how does that work? If you know the ick life cycle here, okay, at some point the ick drops off of the fish and it lives in the substrate, okay, where it multiplies and it grows and it grows and it grows, right? And I don't know how long that takes, three, three nine days it says of feeding the parasitic. Okay, so three to nine days, okay? And it grows and it grows and grows. Then when it's ready, it will go back up and swim in the water column and reattach to your fish. So the tank transfer method negates that by basically saying like, we don't know when the ick falls off, but we know that if we move the fish every three days, roughly, for two weeks, that at one of those movements, we are gonna capture the fish when the, when the ick has dropped off and we're gonna move just the fish into a clean tank, leaving behind the ick. You need two tanks to do this method, and then you need to sterilize your tank. I don't, I don't mean just leave it there. You need to totally sterilize your tank in between you so that you kill the ick. So that's another good method if you have the ability to use the tank transfer method. Okay, freshwater water dip, where you literally take your fish and you put it in fresh water, water, very stressful, very, very stressful to fish. So if your fish is already almost gone, probably gonna kill them, kill them. but also uh, really good at removing external parasites. So for ick that is external, flukes that are external, they hate the fresh water. They will drop off granting temporary relief to your fish. It's not a cure, but it does grant temporary relief to your fish, okay? A UV sterilizer can be helpful. Again, not a cure, because UV sterilizers only treat free floating bacteria and parasites because they have to actually pass through the water column into the UV sterilizer in order to be effective. So not the most effective way, can help uh, prevent an outbreak, but won't cure it. Uh, there are also reef safe medications, which I've used, and some people, every time I mention this, hate it. They hate that I keep recommending this and I'm sorry, but I'm going to keep doing it. There are uh, products, Ruby Reef Rally and Ruby Reef Kick Ick. The Rally is basically formalin and that is really used for, for treating Brooklynella. But the Kick Ick is what is used for treating Ick. Some people have had success with these. It's a reef safe. It's biological filter safe. Some people hate them. I have had mixed success. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't but I use them because I, I use them in a tank that has live rock and has live sand. Okay, what do I recommend? I recommend copper if you can use it or a tank transfer method if that's possible as well. Okay, Mark, that was a long answer. Uh, hope, hope that answered your question. Uh, you can always send me an email, Mark. Um, no worries. You can also send me, I got three fish, 20 gallon, no corals. Yep. So I think I probably did answer your question there. Heat wave. Later, freaky. Oh, see you later. Mark Brenton, thank you. Rogue Aquariums. On my tank at work, the PSI is bad. Only 30 PSI. So I use a booster pump, which is now at 80. If you have low pressure, it will affect your membrane and eventually damage over time. All right, guys. It is 10.59. Anybody have a last question? Anybody have a last question? If not, then we're gonna do the Mr. Rogers and and and, and say goodbye. Uh, if you guys haven't done it yet, if you guys could please like this, that would be great. 
check out my most recent video. We are doing a new series of test kit videos where we're gonna buy every test kit we can. I probably have a thousand dollars worth of test kit videos, no joke. And we just did a video on ammonia test kits. And uh, the next video we're gonna do is nitrate test kits. And I'm actually getting the, getting the new nitrate checker so from Hannah. So we're gonna do like eight different nitrate tests. So that should be really fun. Check that out as well. Check out the giveaway. If you go back and you check over here, it's a $14,000 giveaway. If you wanna sign up for that, that would be great. Okay, that's it everybody. We're gonna call it a day. Two hours, my voice is going. It's time for me to relax and then go enjoy our 109 degree day. So with that, happy reefing everybody. Everybody stays well, and we'll see you again next Friday. Take care.